Holy moly, it has been an eternity since we have done a Tiki Technical Tuesday. I've got some great ideas, a lot of projects I'm working on. I just haven't had time to put one together. So today we are going to do an extra super speedy spray booth power up Tiki Technical Tuesday. Let's go to the spray booth. Here we are in the glaze room and this is my Laguna spray booth. It's a fantastic booth and I've made many modifications to dial it in to make it even more pleasurable to use. Uh, let me walk you through them really quick and then I'll talk about what I want to tackle today. First things first, I realized in the winter I had to put a block of insulating foam in here to keep the cold air from filling up the studio when I wasn't spraying. When I'm ready to go, I just slap in the Laguna included filter and I also put this little hook system in so I have a spot to put the spray gun when I'm not spraying with it. This is essential or else your arm is just going to die from holding the gun up all the time. All around the booth I've got these gooseneck lamps. Now these are LED lights that I got from Ikea and they have a little clip on them which means I can slide them around and point them any direction I need them to go in. They're held up by these what appear to be very fancy purposely built flanges that are in actuality a chopping up block that I got from Bed Bath & Beyond. Cut it into three pieces and it's just this nice nylon plastic works really well with the spray booth. Today I want to tackle this. Uh, when I'm doing multiple coats of glaze, it's hard for me to remember what coat I'm on while glazing because once you get one coat on, two coats looks just like one coat and so on and so forth. So I put this little thing up here and I move this clip along as I glaze. So when I don't have any glaze on it, it's at zero. After I finish the first coat, I move this over to one and that way I know I've got a single coat on all of the things that I'm glazing that day. And then when I get the next coat on, I put it to two. And then when we're all done, this will end up on three. Now this works really well, but it also looks terrible and it's janky like it, you know. I'd like to do something a little more permanent and nice because I use this thing all the time. This is what we're gonna use. It is called Color Core. And it is basically like a plastic, like a plastic sandwich. Uh, they make signs out of it. I got this specifically because they make national park signs out of it. And you can get it in a lot of national park colors, such as this. A green with a white core and then another green layer. Now, I believe for the spray booth, we're going to use a nice high visibility red. Let's design something. First things first, I took some rough measurements to get an idea of just how much room I had to work with. And then I cracked open Adobe Illustrator. I, uh, I'm going to be doing this project using the Shaper Origin. It's a computer controlled router and it uses a vector file to, uh, to control that machine. So I had to lay out my design in a vector. I wanted to make this look kind of quasi national parky, kind of quasi warning sign and just, I don't know, I just wanted to have fun with it. This is really kind of a learning project that will hopefully be practical when it's finished. Okay, I have just uploaded the, um, oh, hang on, the studio is locked. I have uploaded all of the files, well, the file, to the cloud, and I'm going to put it onto the Shaper Origin, that incredible tool from the future uh, that will let me cut out perfectly the design that we just did like, like magic. So, well, hopefully like magic. Hopefully I don't mess this up. It's possibly going to mess this up, but I hope we won't, and uh, I'm always happy to use any excuse I can to take the shaper out. I really should have put a handle in this thing. I didn't I didn't think it, I didn't think it through. I didn't think it through. Okay, so the shaper is one of those curious tools where the setup takes longer than the actual using of it. Um, and I'm sure that if I use the shaper more often, I would be setting it up way faster than I actually end up doing. But, you know, I, I use it when I can. I use it when I can. Um, and on that note of wanting to do things more often, I am sorry it's been taking forever for an episode to come out of Tiki Technical Tuesday. Um, this was a pandemic project that I started during, you know, the first lockdown. And um, it's something that I enjoy doing, but it's also something that I have trouble finding time to do. And then I also can fall into the trap of wanting to it to be really, really good. And I always ask myself, is this subject matter worthy of a video? And 
Let's be honest, it usually is. I should just film what I do in the studio. I, I get the impression that you all like to watch what I do here in the studio, but I'm my own worst critic. At any rate, I apologize for the delay. We're doing this little quick one to just kind of get me into the groove of making Tiki Technical Tuesdays again, and hopefully I will be releasing them more often in the future. All right, let's get this thing in here and start cutting. Come on. So the Shaper Origin is a handheld CNC mill. I'm going to be using this device and it has a little electronic eye on it that will look at all those little domino shaped black and white checkerboard things you saw on that tabletop thing that I was setting up. And by looking at those, it knows exactly where the cutting bit is at any time on this tool. And I can drop a design in, set it up on the virtual kind of playing field that you see here. And then the cutting bit will cut out that design with unbelievable accuracy. Today, we're gonna to be cutting with an engraving bit a flat tipped 1 8 inch router bit and a rounded tip 1 8 inch bit. Now I should say right off the bat that I am very new to the world of computer controlled milling and so there's a zillion options when it comes to cutting tips and I rarely know which one is the best. So we're going to try a few different things on this project to see what works and what doesn't. I figured it would be a safe bet to start with the zero, the biggest kind of number there. And so I did a few test passes to, to see how deep we should cut and what looks best. And lo and behold, kind of the first test I did worked out pretty darn well. So I think we're gonna go with this for the rest of the letters. Now the shaper is unique as it is a handheld CNC device. That means that I have to do the bulk of the movement myself. I am looking at that little kind of crosshairs on the monitor and moving the cutting bit around. Now I am nowhere near as accurate as the machine is. So what it does is it makes up for that extra like quarter inch of movement. So as long as I get within a quarter inch of the target, it does all of the rest, makes extremely smooth paths. It's like playing a video game. I'm just following these dotted lines and the machine takes care of all of the accuracy. It's, it's, it's a very strange thing to use and it's, it's really a lot of fun as long as you don't make a mistake. Okie dokie. All right, well, the engraving bit was incredible. I wish I used the engraving bit for the letters, but you know, live and learn. Uh, I do have some fuzz on this, and that is due to uh, what people who use CNC, like computer controlled routers call feeds and speeds. You wanna control how fast the bit goes through and cuts the material, and you wanna do it at a proper rate so that it moves the material out of the way properly um, and I don't know what the proper feed and speed is for this colored plastic, but this is pretty darn good. I'm going to hit it with a wired brush and then we will attach it to the booth. And oh, oh, I just realized I forgot to put the holes in it for the pop rivets. Oh my gosh, I put them in the file and I didn't cut it because I was so excited. It's okay, you know what? We're gonna do it the old fashioned way with a drill, but we're gonna do it tomorrow because it's dinner time. Good morning. It is 6 a.m. and I just finished casting today's zombie jugs. These have to dwell in these molds for an hour and 15 minutes more. And that means that I've got some time to play around with the spray booth bonus plaque counter thingamabob. I don't know what we're going to call it, but I've got a little bit of time to play on it. And uh, I thought of what I'd like to do to try to get rid of that fuzzy stuff while I was falling asleep last night. It dawned on me that perhaps some trimming tools would trim away that unnecessary plastic fuzz. And I opted to use these two kind of beefy ZM tool trimming tools. They're made for trimming ceramic pottery, but these are very sharp edges. And I thought they might do some nice stuff against that dreaded fuzzy plastic stuff. So the hope is in the next hour or so, I can patiently scrape away this little fuzzy stuff. I was going over it with a wire brush, but I didn't want to affect the overall look of the surface of the plastic. 
So hopefully this little scraper will do the trick. Um, of course, I'm going to do a few more tests on a scrap piece before I cut the plan project that I have in mind for all of this color plastic. Uh, and hopefully I can get a, a feed and speed that works well. I'm also going to go to the Shaper Origin forums and ask around there because I know people cut a lot of signs of this. And I know that they definitely cut a lot of signs of this on all of the national park trails around here. So anyway, let's see how this works. Not bad at all. The scraper trimming tools did a fantastic job getting rid of the fuzz. It just took a little more time than I would have liked. Like I said, I am definitely going to research the proper feed rate and rotor speed for the bits so I don't get any of this fuzz on future cuts. Okay, I have wiped it down. I took it to the sink and scrubbed it all to get the dirt and the whatever off of it. And oh, oh it looks... Super good, it's super clean, super crisp. Really happy with it. Um, yeah, there's still a little bit of fuzz, but I'm not gonna dwell on it. This still looks way better than the blue painter's tape that I had on the spray booth before. Um, is it done? No, I still need to put some holes in this and we need to mount it to the spray booth, but that's gonna have to wait until lunch today because I'm going to zip to the hardware store and get some pop rivets, one of my favorite tools from childhood. I'll talk about that when we get the pop rivets. Uh, so I'll get the pop rivets, make sure that my sizes are correct before I drill holes in this, and then we'll mount it up. Ha ha! Okay, I am back from the hardware store and we have got pop rivets. We have got a, a very bright sunbeam. We have got washers in the entirely wrong size because I thought I was gonna get a larger pop rivet and then I changed my mind and got a smaller one, but I didn't get the smaller washers. I don't think it's gonna be an issue. And lastly, I got this fancy clip. I was just gonna get like a little, just a stainless steel hook to put onto the uh, the uh, the matic rack, but I think this is even better. And let me tell you why. Um, Ta-da, it stays on there and I won't bump it off. Um, I always worry that I'll be glazing and I'll knock the hook off or the clip that I have on there now and then I'll forget what coat I was on. So this is super secure. It's not gonna go anywhere. I'm pretty stoked about it. All right, uh, let's plot out these holes for the pop rivets. What's a pop rivet? I'm so glad you asked. This is a pop rivet gun. Well, I don't know if that's what it's actually called, but that's what I call it. And it's a special tool used to install pop rivets. What's a pop rivet? Well, it's one of these tiny little doodads. Now, this is actually a rivet on a nail. And what the pop rivet gun does is it's going to suck that nail out of the rivet head, expanding it, and it will squash two things together. As an example, I'm going to stick together these two pieces of 8th inch MDF wood. I'll put the pop rivet in there and start pumping away on the rivet gun's handle. Now, pop rivets are great because you can stick two flat materials together. and You don't have to access the back of the material. Now, you can see as I'm working the gun, that nail is going to get drawn out through the rivet head and it will expand the rivet head and lock those two things together. Oh, that was the pop. That was the pop, everyone. That's why they call it a pop rivet, when that nail pops out of the rivet. Now, this one has a lot uh, sticking out the back here because this pop rivet is designed for using uh, something that's a half inch thick. That's the target thing. So you can get ones that are, this would have been better served by a quarter inch thick pop rivet. And if I use that, there would be a lot less of this kind of extra material sticking out of the back. But as you can see, the front side is very clean, very nice. Um, I can tell you that my favorite memory about pop rivets and pop rivet guns is when I was a kid, I used to love drawing uh, suits of armor. I love knights, I love suits of armor. And my dad, when I was a kid, got me a big sheet of um, silver like poster board and he made a helmet and uh, he held it together with pop rivets in the back. And I just remember being mystified by the, like the ejected rivet. Hey, how do I get that out of there? There we go. I thought it was so cool just how you could rivet together. It was like making a real suit of armor, very happy memory. I think of that every single time I put a pop rivet into something. Um, it's just a cool tool and I'm always excited when I need to stick two flat things together uh, cleanly and I get to use one. I don't do it often, but it's always fun when I do. That being said, let's drill some holes into this and uh, put it up on the board. 
All right, well, after removing the old school tape counter that we're getting rid of, it was time to figure out exactly where to place these holes. I wanted to avoid the thick flange at the opening of the spray booth and just make sure that I had a good balanced placement for the holes. I did my best to space things out with the ruler and marked the exact spots that I thought the pop rivets would look best on this sign. Now, before I reach for the drill, I double check the packaging on the rivets. It's nice. They are very specific about how big of a hole you should make. And I want to double check to make sure that they were long enough for the material I was going to be using. And then it was time to drill some holes. You know what, I'm going to set the one rivet and then drill the other hole. It is barely coming out the other side. I hope it's enough. So you want to push and then squeeze. And you want to push, squeeze. Oh, there's the pop. Ha ha! Yeah, that is on there. All right, um, let's put the other one in. Get this one in. Woo! Fabulous. It looks so good. All right, the final moment of truth, my fancy clip. Let's see how it goes. Oh, it's perfect, it's perfect. Looks like we're on coat one, everyone. Oh, coat two. Coat three. Ah, so good. And I'm not going to knock this off in the middle of glazing and forget where I was. Fantastic. And it looks super cool. Super spiffy. I got to tell you, when I finish a project like this, it's hard to not beat myself up for living with those awful pieces of blue tape and that little clip for as long as I did. I spend hours upon hours upon hours in the spray booth, so it's going to be really nice to have a clean, crisp-looking counter to help me along my way. The Kodomatic, it is up, it is installed. Thank you all for joining me on this spray booth upgrade adventure. I hope that it inspires you to take a tool that you use all the time, some piece of equipment that you love using, and make it even more yours. Uh, if you have any uh, questions about the spray gun, the compressor, or the booth itself, I do talk about it a bit more in a past episode of Tiki Technical Tuesday. I'll put a link for it around here at the end of the video. Uh, and I can tell you that our next episode of Tiki Technical Tuesday will also be about a core workhorse of the studio. That's right, I'm talking about our electric kilns. Uh, until then, I want to thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please do. It means a lot. And thank you for your patience in the incredible amount of time it's taken in between the last episode and this one. These zombies have taken over our lives. What can I say? Anyway, thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next episode.